everyone, welcome back to Clutch Situation. I wanted to do a, something a little bit different for this video because as a creator here on YouTube, it often helps to break things up a little bit and do some things that are a little bit different so that it's not the same old thing all the time. And I realized just about a, a week ago or so that I'd never done a question and answer video on my channel. And those are videos that, you know, tend to uh, find an audience here on YouTube. And many of you have asked many questions over the years that I've been doing this. And so I figured why not. And uh, while I'm doing this, I'm going to be doing a little bit of reorganization so that if you're more of a watch person rather than a uh, than a listen person, you'll have something that you'll be able to check out here. And this will lead into one of the questions that viewers have asked as well. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and dive right in uh, to your questions. We're going to do about 13 of these. And so thanks to those of you who have submitted questions. And uh, some of your names, I apologize if I'm going to butcher them. Some of your names, I'm honestly not going to attempt. And it's not personal because... Uh, I, I am just not going to be able to do it. So let's just uh, dive right in. The first question comes from Pranay Gosar, and their question is, do you know where we can get lead cases that are jumbo-sized, as in being able to hold 60 or so leads? Uh, also, do you know where we can find cases with cool opening mechanics, such as a push-down button? I remember seeing one in the video at some point, and I did reply on the comments feature on YouTube uh, to... Pranay and had asked for a little bit of clarification because I wasn't sure what they meant by jumbo sized lead cases and uh, I got a response back and Pranay clarified that um, you know a container to hold more than uh, an increased amount of the normal 50 millimeter leads and that question really intrigues me because I guess it really isn't something that I had considered before uh, a larger size lead case, but it makes sense. And, and so what I did is I pulled a couple of lead cases here from the collection so that we can check them out. And not all of them are push button ones, but some of them are. And uh, so here's some that I pulled that I think meet your requirements. And so I recently reviewed the Derwent Precision and that comes with a lead case that is a click button one. So you click down and it opens up the case and you can get the lead out, <laughs> get the lead out, and uh, you unclick it and, and it shuts it. And the Zebra, at least this Zebra uh, lead case uh, that's marked MPL in glittery letters here, that also has a uh, push button mechanism as well and you know my recommendation is just uh to continue to uh look online for things that you see the zebra one was a little bit difficult to close there and then not quite push button but the um pilot neox graphite comes with this flip case which i think that this is a very well designed case because it's very easy to open very easy to shut but also holds lead securely i think that you could probably get a decent amount of leads in there and so if we focus a little bit close to the camera you can see that there's quite a bit of space in there and uh you could purchase this for a relatively low price you know just a couple uh dollars usd and you'd be able to uh probably hold like a lot of leads in here now this one comes with 40 pieces and i i'm thinking that you could probably fit a, a decent amount in there but then the question is would you be able to easily get them out when the case case is open uh but you know worth experimenting with and then i think that this uni nano dio case is a rather large case that if, if we zoom, well not zoom, if we uh, focus in a little bit closer on this one, you can see that there's quite a bit of space in that case. And this is an example of a case that would be very easy to fill. You just slide it open and the leads are all exposed there and you could get quite a, quite a bit in there. Now, many of these lead cases are several years old, so I can't pretend to know what they would be like, you know, now as companies update their products, but that's something for you to consider for, for that as well. And so, uh, all right, I'm going to tick off the questions as we go. Number one is down. Number two uh, comes from Tech Kid. What was your first nice mechanical pencil? Well, nice is relative. Uh, for me, the only mechanical pencils that I had used in elementary school were really the Papermate Sharp Writers, which by any Buddy's imagination is not what I would consider a nice mechanical pencil. But my first upgrade, and I've spoken 
on the channel about this before is the Pentel Quicker Clicker, and this is the classic variant. I consider this to be a nice pencil for somebody who goes into a shop and is just looking to buy a mechanical pencil. Now, in terms of nice, nice mechanical pencils, like luxury mechanical pencils, that for me would definitely be uh, the Pelican D200 was uh, the first mechanical pencil that many would consider to truly be a quote-unquote nice mechanical pencil. And uh, so, uh, thank you for your question. Moving right along. Number three. Got to turn a page. Robogato asks, how have mechanical pencils changed since you first started collecting? Well, I guess it depends upon what you define as my collecting point. Um, my first collection, I guess, uh, was me just owning a couple mechanical pencil in the 1990s when I was in school. Uh, I didn't really start collecting en masse again until around 2013. And I didn't start this YouTube channel until 2015. And so um, mechanical pencils have changed a little bit over that time span in that the big uh, push for companies has been in getting a lot more features into their mechanical pencils. Uh, I'm going to use the Twister Race 3 as an example, but the Twister Race 3 has been along for a very, very long time. This sort of style of putting features over quality has been, I think, the big push in the industry over a decades long period. And so getting bigger twist up erasers and mechanical pencils, getting features like uh, lead cushioning systems uh, ha have been features that have changed in mechanical pencils over time. But um, right now we're kind of in a state where uh, development of mechanical pencils is kind of being driven by the Kickstarter market, uh, honestly. Uh, I'm not, that isn't to say that uh, large companies aren't putting out mechanical pencils. Uh, the, the innovation are more on the economy end, it would seem, than, than on other ends. And, you know, every year we'll get a couple new pencils that have come out that, uh, that uh, companies are trying out new things. But uh, this is not the golden days of the 90s, so to speak, when, when there were just a lot of really high quality, but fewer mechanical pencils out there. There's still lots of companies that are producing new variants of mechanical pencils, uh, but that's sort of what I see as the uh, variation that is happening with uh, mechanical pencils over time. Next question, moving on to number four. Ed Rice asks, what are your EDC pencils? For those of you who don't know, EDC stands for Everyday Carry. And that's sort of like a collecting uh, perspective all in, all in itself. Uh, everyday carry includes anything that basically a person carries with them on an everyday basis, hence everyday carry. And so you get uh, people interested in key rings, you get people interested in flashlights, you get people interested in uh, knives, you get people interested in small tools that, that you can carry in your pocket, and there's a huge market for this on Kickstarter. Basically, it's all small tools that will fit in a pocket or a purse or, or a backpack that people carry around with them on an everyday basis that they want to make sure that, that they have in, in case they need it. And so uh, my EDC pencil is basically what you see in front of you right now. Uh, most days I'm carrying a Pentel Sharp series pencil. I am not done collecting Pentel Sharps. I plan to collect Pentel Sharps as long as they keep producing variants. There are very few of these collections that that I have a full set of. So for example, the uh, Marble series I have a full set of. And uh, uh, I have a full set of the Target uh, pastel series pencils. I have a full set of the quote-unquote normal production Pentel series pencils in the classic brown, green, burgundy, uh, blue, and yellow uh, of varying lead sizes. I have some of the metallic series, but not all. And so for me, it basically comes down to cost and, and price. What can I afford at any particular day? Uh, and uh, you can see that I'm trying to arrange these by color coding, so I'm going to need to do some rearranging here. Uh, this is the Gilded series over here on the left-hand side, but for me mostly it is the uh, Pentel Sharp that is my everyday carry. It's lightweight, it does its job, 
Uh, and uh, so I really like it a lot. Um, that isn't to say that there aren't other pencils that I carry on an everyday basis. You can check out my uh, most recent top 10 video, which I plan to update my top 10 video soon, uh, since some changes have happened over the last uh, uh, 10 months or so. Uh, and uh, that may be the last top 10 video that I do for a while because I'm sort of feeling like I'm at a place where my top 10 videos are pretty solid and uh, I know what's going on and I'm willing to uh, to sort of um, put a uh, pause on it for a little bit while. Looks like I'm missing the, the green marble one. It's probably uh, upstairs on the counter, and so I'm going to have to uh, update that as well. So, uh, Ed, uh, my main EDC pencil would be the Pentel Sharp for sure. Uh, but, you know, consult my top ten for other ones. I also find myself carrying a Pentel Sharp Carry frequently if they uh, if it matches my wardrobe for that particular day. On days when I need to be doing, like, a lot of rubric work with students at school, I will carry Twist Erase 3s just so that I have that eraser with me because I'll need to be erasing and updating uh, rubrics for stuff. And so uh, that's uh, something that I do. Uh, Brian Friedlander asks, do you think that different mechanical pencils are better for certain tasks, uh, drawing, doing math, drafting, design work? If so, which ones would you choose for the various tasks? Well, honestly, Brian, I don't really feel, and I've said this many times on the channel, that I'm qualified to comment on what value different people get out of uh, different pencils because I'm not a drafts person. I don't draw... Uh, for me, for everyday list making and writing tasks, I do a lot of writing of feedback, for example. Um, it, it really just comes down to my personal preference of what feels comfortable in my hand. And so, so for some people, it's ergonomic. For some people, it's the grip. Uh, for me, tends to err on the side of the lightweight in terms of the Pentel Sharps. And so uh, I'm always of the opinion that it, an individual really just needs to do some personal research to figure out what they think is going to be the best thing for them. So thank you for your question. Number six, uh, the uh, user's name is A.V. What do you think is the most beautiful mechanical pencil of all? Something you'd smile with delight at every time you looked at it. It's not so much a specific pencil that catches my eye. It's uh, elegant engineering is really what personally catches my eye. And so that's where I lean towards something like the Pentel S S55 here. Um, this is pretty bare bones for most people, but what attracts my eye to it is that it is elegant and it's classic in terms of its overall uh, depiction. And uh, so drafting pencils tends to be pencils that catch my eye. Utilitarian pencils are really what attracts my eye. And so if we go to the most recent uh, pencil that I reviewed, uh, the Modern Fuel 2.0, the 2.0 really catches my eye as a work of art because it is so egalitarian and basically does its job and uh, its simplicity in, in, in of itself. If it ain't broke, don't fix it is, is my big uh, approach to, to a lot of these things. And that isn't to say that there aren't other features that, that other people would, would like or would not like, but for me, that's a big thing that uh, I look for in a uh, work of art and a mechanical pencil. I like that simplistic design. Okay, moving right along. Number seven, Michael. How many pencils do you own? Do you have a favorite pen? What are your other hobbies? Well, I'm going to hit that other hobbies question pretty hard because I, I appreciate the fact that, that some of you are, are willing to ask about uh, things that are personally interesting to me. And I'm going to move this case out of the way um, to make room for the cigar box while we're doing this. Um, I don't smoke. Um, but I do appreciate cigar boxes uh, as a storage unit, and so I think I got this one in Washington, D.C. at the big flea market area uh, in Washington, D.C., and I brought it home on a trip that I was in, and uh, it becomes great for storing pencil kit and things. And this will be a good opportunity to answer part of your question as well. How many pencils do you own? Honestly, Michael, I don't know. Um, probably somewhere in the hundreds range. A lot of them are economy pencils that uh, a couple years ago when I was first trying out uh, some different things, uh, I was uh, just basically exploring. And while I was exploring, I, I found uh, um, 
a lot of economy pencils that I wanted to try out, and I basically learned that I don't like a lot of those economy pencils because of the plastic clutch. But uh, that's something that um, that I uh, find interesting, and uh, so I'm not really sure. Is is the short answer? Probably in the hundreds. Uh, favorite pen? Well, here's a replacement cartridge, and I have a bunch of these replacement cartridges because I was at a store that had them on sale, so I just uh, stocked up. Um, my favorite uh, pen cartridge is the Fisher Space Pen, and I think somebody asked a, a, a question about uh, pens, and so I'm going to save a little bit more information for their question. But uh, and basically, anything that I can stick a Fisher Space Pen cartridge in. But in terms of pens, uh, in terms of uh, EDC. The pens that I select on a daily basis, it's going to be the Retro 51 uh, Tornado is is a pen that I really like. What are my other hobbies? Well, gosh, my main other hobbies uh, are uh, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Okay, so anybody who's seen me whenever I'm bare-armed on the channel has seen my Rebel Alliance tattoo that I have. Uh, and so in terms of primary fandoms that I have of, of things that I'm interested in, I'm a huge science fiction reader, uh, the works of Philip K. Dick. Uh, I'm really into Ray Bradbury right now. And uh, big Harry Potter fan. Uh, Harry Potter is probably the fandom that my wife and I share most closely and is sort of a, a big connection for she and I. Um, I'm really into gaming, uh, specifically role-playing games. Uh, I also play uh, board games extensively, and uh, I'm a member of an organization here in Omaha called Spielbound. And so if you want to check out Spielbound.org, that is a board game cafe that was kickstarted several years ago, and uh, that is an example of uh, something that I sort of do as a... Uh, a hobby to give back. Oh yeah, I have this platinum converter box. It's already in the pen. It's already in the fountain pen. So, so uh, there it is. Uh, so yeah, I have a wide variety of other hobbies. And if there were one thing that I want people on the channel to understand, because sometimes I'll get questions like, uh, um, gosh, I don't know, questions that sort of imply that this is the only thing that I do. <laughs> Okay, and this is not the only thing that I do. Honestly, folks, mechanical pencils are just one of many hobbies that I have, and I think it's important for people in general to have hobbies uh, that that they like, that they give them a release um, from the uh, challenges of everyday life. And so uh, role-playing is probably my dominant hobby. Like, like if I had to give up role-playing, that would be a serious problem for me. My main games are Call of Cthulhu and Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition. Um, if you're interested in checking out my other channel, I have another channel, believe it or not. Uh, it's called RPG Imaginings. And so if you search for RPG Imaginings on YouTube, you'll find it. And so I do reviews of mostly Call of Cthulhu, but also some classic Dungeons and Dragons products, other role-playing games that I'm interested in. And so if anybody is interested in checking that out, I would encourage you to uh, dive on over there uh, to check it out. Michael, thanks for your question. Um, David Buckheister is a longtime fan of the channel, and uh, I always appreciate when David comments because he is always super respectful and insightful with, insightful with his comments, and he has some insightful questions here as well. And so, David, thank you so much for contributing uh, these questions. Um, did you jump on the Spoke Pen Kickstarter? Uh, I did not. And part of the reason for that is that uh, pens just... I don't write in pen frequently. I'm a teacher. I do a lot of erasing. Pencils are my preferred medium. Sometimes I do need to write in pen, uh, but it, that is actually a very rare occasion. In terms, if I were to rate uh, how much time I spend writing with pens versus pencil, I spend 90% of my time writing in pencils and 10% writing in pen. So I did not jump on the spoke pen Kickstarter. And going back to Michael's question about other hobbies, I decided to back something related to role playing games instead. And so, uh, you know, it, it really just depends upon what uh, something is going on at any given time. Um, I would love to know, this is continuing David uh, with David's post, I would love to know more about how you decided to get into teaching. Was it the love of the subject, a passion for teaching, maybe some highlights and challenges of your teaching career? That, that could be a video in itself, and so I'm going to try to be brief on this because I want to uh, keep this down to a reasonable video length. Um, I decided to get into teaching. I was in the hard sciences before I decided to get into teaching. And I was in research. I was working towards a PhD. And TAing, being a teaching assistant in a university, was far more enjoyable to me than the research aspect of things. 
And uh, one of the things that tends to happen in academia is that the research emphasis is so heavy that there tends to be, um, shall we say, passive aggressiveness uh, directed at the teaching aspect of it. A lot of people consider it an annoyance. A lot of college professors don't, okay? But a lot of the people that I've encountered consider teaching to be an annoying thing that they have to do um, when they could be doing research. That was not my feeling or my attitude. And uh, so I switched to uh, some science education. I'm endorsed in uh, science education 7 through 12, specifically biology, um, because my undergraduate degree was in zoology. And uh, I really haven't looked back at all. Um, yeah, I, I started with a love of the subject, but it turned into a love of people it is really the, the most fair thing that I could say. When people talk to me about my uh, about teaching now, a lot of what I say is is that, uh, you know, I got into science, but I, I don't really consider myself a science teacher. I consider myself an educator because although science is a huge part of my life, that's how I met my wife. It's where all my training is. Uh, what I get most out of this job is interacting and mentoring people and helping people is the big thing that, that uh, of what teaching is for me. So uh, my, my passion is really right now directed towards uh, helping people, teaching truly as a social, uh, social uh, endeavor. But in terms of the challenge of it, what is most interesting to me in terms of the challenge is that it's very, very difficult to understand you can't be in somebody else's brain. And so part of the job is to help them get in touch with their own brain so that they can understand how to learn something in the best way that they can. And that's incredibly difficult. And uh, that level of challenge is part of the reason why I decided to switch from the hard sciences to teaching. Because folks, and you know what, I may get some flack from, from this, for this, but I don't care. Uh, teaching uh, is harder than science. Okay. No, no bones about it. Okay. And, uh, that's part of the reason why I decided to do it because I was looking for a challenge that, that research science, um, couldn't survive. Now, if you're in research science, more power to you. Everybody's got to do what they like. Um, but I challenge any research scientist to step into a K through 12 classroom and do it well for a year, uh, before, before you form your opinion. Okay, I've been in both. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. My Einstein 0.7 HB, the, a dog got a hold of the case, and so I had to sort of kit bash um, one of these lead holders to, to keep my Einstein lead in. I'm glad that I found that, so it's good that I'm doing this little tour of the pencil kit cigar box right now as we're going through. Um, yeah, uh, some highlights and challenges of your teaching career. I think that probably the biggest highlight for me has been that uh, I've had the opportunity to really push the envelope of teaching and learning at, in the district that I teach at. Uh, I've been supported in really trying to uh, make challenging decisions about the profession that will help us to move forward and not be stuck in a traditional model. Uh, that doesn't work for students. Um, my area of expertise in assessment, for example, um, you know, people assume that I'm a numbers guy as a result of that, but but very much not so. Um, when I start my assessment class at university, uh, I always lead with uh, assessment is about inducing a feeling about learning in students. And those feelings can be positive feelings or they can be negative feelings. And a lot of uh, the truth of traditional assessment is that traditional assessment um, tends to have a very uh, robotic uh, approach to uh, and a very responsibility focus, which, folks, there's nothing wrong with responsibility. But uh, one thing that traps a lot of teachers is that they get so intensely focused on the responsibility component of it that they can sometimes forget about the, you know, actual learning part of it, which is, which is critical. And so, um, I've been fortunate enough in my career that I've, that I've been teaching in a district that, uh, values innovation and sort of, uh, uh, organizes all of its, uh, mission statement around innovation. And, uh, that's, uh, allowed me to accomplish a lot of things, uh, in, in terms of, uh, pushing the profession. 
Uh, so yeah, um, thank you, David, for your questions. Um, number nine, we're already at number nine. I don't want the video to go too long. So um, do you have an email I can reach out to you with? Uh, I would very much prefer if you would uh, send me a letter at my P.O. box. Uh, one of the things that I've been trying to do this year on the channel is to... Uh, I've been trying to be a little bit more mindful of my privacy on YouTube. And so I got the P.O. box so that if you wanted to contact me and it was really important for you to contact me and you didn't want to do it over the YouTube's comment feature, that you would do it uh, in this way. Okay, And I'm not trying to be standoffish or anything, but... Um, if you've recently contacted me, oh, so this question comes from Vexpens. Um, so Vexpens, uh, you sent a lot of questions over the last couple days. And uh, part of what any creator needs to do is curate uh, how they interact with the public. And so uh, I'm not giving out my email address. Okay, I'd really appreciate it if you would just send a letter to my P.O. box. And uh, that's a way that we can start a conversation. Uh, and so, oh, also don't forget, folks, um, I have a Patreon. I have zero patrons. Uh, and that's all well and good. That's fine. Um, for whatever reason, you know, uh, the content that I've been pr producing on the channel has been enough of, for people. They haven't f felt inclined to contribute to the Patreon. Um, I'm just going to do a shout out for the Patreon. If you were willing to become a patron of the channel, even for like a dollar per month, um, it would help me to uh, purchase more pencils for review. And one thing that I'm uh, prepared to do for anyone who becomes a patron of me uh, on Patreon would be to have either exclusive videos on Patreon that only Patreon members, uh, only contributors get, um, or having early releases of videos that uh, come out before they go live on YouTube. And so if you're, you know, if if you'd be interested in doing that, you know, check it out. So I'll just leave this up here in, in case you want to engage in that way. Those are going to be your choices. Um, number 10, we're flying through. Clear Obsession asks, what other interests do you follow other than mechanical pencils? I've sort of talked about some of my other hobbies. Yeah, I've noticed that you've delved into fountain pens. Did that trigger any passions yet? Well, uh, I have delved into fountain pens recently. And so uh, here we have... Uh, uh, a uh, platinum balance, uh, which uh, is this the balance? I think that this is the balance. Um, I've found that I really enjoy platinum fountain pens. Um, I for Christmas I also got a Lamy Studio fountain pen. Okay, you can tell what my favorite color is, and sh shout out to the role playing group. My favorite color is emerald green. Uh, and so uh, here's some examples of some fountain pens that I've gotten into recently. I'm learning that I really like Pilot Nibs. Uh, David Buckheister had sent me a, a Pilot Metropolitan, and I've been using that extensively um, in addition to the other fountain pens that I have. And I'm finding that the Pilot Nib still uh, is the one that, that uh, I'm most using. And uh, so... Uh, yeah, I've, I've recently gotten into fountain pens as well, and I've been doing a lot of grading with these fountain pens. In fact, since we're snowed in today in Omaha, I'm going to be getting some grading done today because, you know, contrary to popular belief, teachers aren't just lounging in lounge chairs. We are salaried employees, and we're doing work even when we're not at school. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, those are some examples of uh, some of the uh, things that have triggered a passion for fountain pens for me. Number 11. Uh, Gautam Narayan says, I started with mechanical pencils and moved on to fountain pens, but keep both close to heart. What is your single favorite item in each of the following categories? Mechanical pencil. That's easy. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Pentel Sharp is my favorite. It's not number one on the top ten because my top ten is sort of rating the quality of mechanical pencils. But uh, for me, uh, Pentel Sharp is my favorite uh, favorite mechanical pencil. Fountain pen. Well, as I said, uh, the nib, the Pilot nib is my favorite one, but I definitely love this Lamy Studio that I got for Christmas. Um, definitely my favorite uh, thus far. Uh, rollerball pen. Uni. Uh, gosh, okay. I got want to make sure that I get it right. Um, the, uh, what, what's the Uni rollerball pen that has, like, the ink chamber that you can see? Uh, I... It's the Uni Ball. 
I'm totally blanking on it right now, but whatever that one is, that's that's my favorite rollerball pen. Uh, it's got this this dark black body, and there's like a little chamber here that you can sort of see the ink level, and it's been around for a long time. It's got a gray, usually has like a gray body or a gray cap. That's my favorite um, rollerball pen and ballpoint pen. Uh, basically, I like I prefer emulsions, and so the Fisher Space Pen, this pressurized uh, cartridge that was developed for the space program. Um, I, I love and any any pen that I can fit a Parker style Fisher Space Pen cartridge in. That's what I select. I like sort of the an ink that will write anywhere, that'll write upside down, that'll write on a wet surface, that'll write in a wide variety of temperature ranges. And that isn't to say that other cartridges uh, won't do that. Uh, but Fisher Space Pen ballpoint refills are definitely my favorite uh, pen. Uh, and so number twelve, we're getting close to the end here. Michael asks. You ever think about designing your own pencil? Honestly, Michael, I don't have time is the short answer to that question. Um, if I had some benefactor or if I had somebody who was doing the engineering and new CAD or whatever program would allow them to do the design and would help me with production, well, anything's on the table, but uh, I don't see myself having time, unfortunately, to do something like that. But I do appreciate that question because, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about mechanical pencils and there are definitely some features that... I would like to see that don't exist in current mechanical pencils. And so if ever I had an opportunity to do something like that, I would be happy to advise people. I really appreciate that people on Kickstarter, like Brian Conti uh, and uh, Modern Fuel, are doing what they're doing, bringing really great mechanical pencils. And so I also kind of don't really see a need at this stage. Uh, and then I'm, I'm thinking that it's, it starts with Nico. Okay, and I can't pronounce the rest of it. Okay, clearly a gentleman. Greetings from Greece. Okay, um, and so um, I'm abbreviating it Nico, and I don't even know if that's even the, an appropriate nickname. Um, but I don't want to butcher your name. So, do you have any fountain pens? Oh, already covered that. What is better, Pentel Graph Gear 1000 or Pentel P200 series for student? Well, once again, that's going to come down to personal preference. The key difference between those two is that the Graph Gear 1000 is significantly heavier and it's all metal construction and it has a retractable sleeve. Pentel P200 series is plastic. It's very lightweight, and it is not a retractable sleeve. And so, as always, you got to sort of ask yourself, what is the best combination of features for you? And I know that sometimes if you don't have a lot of money and you, you can't invest in trying out a bunch of pencils, you're trying to hit the mark immediately so that you get, you know, what you want right out of the gate. Um, but that's one of the challenges of using any tool that, you know, sometimes it can be uh, a tad difficult to... Uh, to nail down exactly what you like. And so I wish you success in, in deciding um, uh, what's going on. And then this is the last one that we're going to do for this Q&A. Uh, and that is uh, Smash versus Graph Gear 1000 for drafting. This comes from Karim Yuga, uh, Yoigur. Uh, and uh, wow, both great pencils. Um, the Smash is only being produced right now in alternate stock. Here's my uh, classic Smash uh, 0.5. Um, you know, once again, I'm not a drafter, and so if grip is super important to you, the Smash is going to be a far better choice, I think, than the Graph Gear 1000 because it has these rubber nibs that really help you dock this thing in your hand. And so um, that's it. We're going to wrap up our Q&A video. And so, folks, thanks so much for contributing your questions. If I didn't get to some of your questions, if you wanted to write me at my P.O. Box, please consider doing that. I'll do some more question and answer videos uh, sometime in the future. And so I really appreciate uh, all of you engaging with me on the channel and I hope that we're doing something that allows us to share a collective hobby so that uh, you know we can all de-stress on, on whatever the stressors are in our individual lives and that's sort of what we're here for that that uh, everybody can have access to something that they love even if they're a world away and uh, even if even if uh, the whatever you're working with on a daily basis is just the computer in front of you or your phone in front of you watching these videos if I can do anything to, to help make your day easier, we should all be celebrating our hobbies. So have a great day. More videos coming up on Clutch Situations. Stay tuned.